Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over UFC Kansas City from a uh, DFS perspective. Uh, as you know, tomorrow I'm going to be doing this from a betting perspective, which also, as you know, is a completely different approach. This particular DFS card is very interesting because there is a theme running through this uh, analysis, which uh, hasn't really shown up in quite some time, but we're going to get to it in a second. First thing to note about this card is the absence of really, really strong inside the distance props, especially from the big favorites. Um, now, again, remember the way uh, pricing works with DraftKings scoring, excuse me, with uh, DraftKings pricing. They do it on a linear scale. In other words, they always have somebody around 9,500 and they always go from 9,500 down to say 8,100. And then on the underdog side, they go from, you know, like 8K, 7,900 down to about 6,700 with everybody adding up to 12.2. They don't really have a dynamic pricing model uh, depending on who is on the slate. So what happens is, is let's just say, take it to the extreme, that you had 14 fights and all of them were five to one favorites, okay? Half of them would be around 8K or 8,200 or 8,400 or priced as if they were basically picking fights. Um they don't, they don't adjust their linear pricing model to the actual context of the slate, which sometimes provides some pretty good value just on the money line. So that's a very obvious thing to notice that not that many people notice. Um, so sometimes we, you know, we've had cards where you've had like 10 guys that were like, not 10 guys, maybe like four or five guys that would be like not eight, six to one favorites. And they had no choice but to make one of them say 9K and the other one 9,400. Where some fights, where some fight cards, you'd have the biggest favorite on the card be like 2.5 to 1, and they would end up being 9,400. So it, it makes for a very interesting um, uh, number crunch with respect to making projections and not only on an individual basis, but oh, for a lineup as a whole. Um, so let, let's get into this because you look at some of these inside the distance props for some of these expensive fighters, they're extremely poor. Remember, we talk about guys that are over 9K. You, you need inside the distance props of at least pick them, you know, sometimes even more um, coupled in some cases with that grappling upside. Because if you don't have grappling upside and you're priced over 9K, you're really kind of prisoner of, of getting that first round KO with the some very very rare exceptions of where you can get a big big volume based striking decision um so like for example let's look at some of these you know higher priced fighters let's let's kind of price look at them this way um where you take zach cummings for example he's 9600 you know for a 9600 dollar fighter he, he would need to have an inside the distance prop of maybe you know minus 200 or at the very least you know minus 120 plus a lot of grappling upside and when you look at him, he is Zach Cummings inside the distance is plus 230. You know what I mean? That is just an atrocious, atrocious line um, for that price. And then you take a look at the next one down on the list. Uh, I mean, all of them. Garcia at 9,500. He is, his inside the distance prop is... Garcia inside the distance it was like plus 250 or plus 200. Again, just atrocious for this price. And it just keeps going on and on. We can go through all these. Uh, Christian Gutierrez, 9,400, right? 9,400, again, you want to have like minus 140 or so, or at least inside the distance, but maybe minus 110 plus grappling upside. And he, Gutierrez, Gutierrez inside the distance plus like 400. So you have this, 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 this slate where these favorites by their normal metrics are just atrocious plays, okay? So in the absence of really strong inside the distance props, the, the key to analyzing this fight card, okay? The key metric, the key concept is one of pace, okay? You are going to be identifying those fights that have a high pace because High pace 
creates just more action and more activity. And especially in these mid-range fights as well, um, you're not going to need to get first round KOs to, to win these slates. I mean, you looked at the highest price guys are, are, you know, your median projections probably should be like 80. You know what I mean? Um, so you're not going to need that much out of these mid range winners, you know, to outscore the 93, 9,400 guys. So in the absence of a good inside the distance prop in any of them, the key is going to be those fights with a lot of pace because the, the more pace you have, the more reversals, the more pace you have, the more takedowns, the more pace, the more volume. And those types of points are going to add up on a card like this in the absence of very, very strong inside distance props. So that that's kind of the theme as we kind of like go through some of these fights and you'll see the difference between some of them. Um, like for example, let's start with, with, with Kudalova, Jocelyn Edwards. I mean, this is, uh, was 8,400, 7,800, something like that. A lot of mid-range pricing that you're going to want to look at this week, but we'll take a look at it and look like all the others, the terrible inside the distance prop, uh, Edwards inside the distance plus 400, Pudelota plus 400. And the problem is this fight really doesn't rate to, to operate at a high pace. You know, if anything, maybe Pudelota has a little bit of an upside as far as that goes, just because in her last fight, she was able to wrestle and get a ground and pound victory. But that was the first time I think she's ever gotten a finish. If not the first time, the first time in a long time. And Jocelyn Edwards is no, you know, is no pushover. So, I mean, this fight race to be really slow. Okay. So in the absence of a good inside the distance prop, this is a really, really poor fight to target on DraftKings. The only side I would even think of playing is Pewdelova. And that feels almost like a sucker bet, you know, because if you play her, you're really in recency bias mode and you're presuming that the only that you're you're rooting for an outcome that although it's never happened before, it happened in her last fight. Um, but I will say that she's probably a more likely candidate to be used on draft teams than Edwards. I just think this is one of those like slow paced fights. Um, so Gaston uh, Bolanos, he's another one that that's pretty high priced. He's 9,200. We'll take a look at the inside distance prop. This one I don't think is bad. Okay. So this is the one fight that has a good inside the distance prop. Uh, he's plus 100. And I was going to say that, this is probably, you know, going to generate a lot of action. I mean, Bolanos comes out and just basically just throws a zillion spinning back this and just goes a little bit crazy. And Aaron Phillips, I mean, he basically owns a gym. He doesn't really fight anymore. I have a feeling that he's just kind of coming in, you know, just to finish out his contract and maybe advertise his gym a little bit. So I don't expect him to put up much of a fight, sort of, you know what I mean? Like, I think he'll try some stuff, maybe go for something quick and maybe, I don't know, maybe try for some wrestling or something. But if he can't get it, I don't expect him to put on too much of a, a resistance. So um, this is probably the one fight that has a good enough inside the distance prop that it really does stand out over the others, especially the favorite. So let's start off with, with Bolanos as, you know, as a good play. Now, again, you are going to need, well, are you going to need a first round knockout? I mean, you might not because... All these other fighters that I just kind of identified as like above 9,300 are really, really poor plays. Um, so Bolanos might be able to get there in a second round knockout, which I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty likely. I mean, considering that Phillips again is probably mailing this one in, I don't think that he's gonna again just fight claw and, and fight back. You know, I think if he's fighting, if he's fighting any adversity, he'll just probably just give up. So uh I do like Bolanos here. All right, next one, uh, Brazil Gomes. So this is, again, this is a, uh, this has the possibility of being a good pace fight. Um, let's take a look at the, um, whatchamacallit, let's take a look at the inside the distance prop, first of all. So Brazil is 9,300. And again, you're going to need an inside the distance prop of at least pick them or a grappling upside. Well, she doesn't really have the grappling upside and her inside the distance prop is plus 300. So that's terrible. But the one thing I would say is that Gomes at least might create some action. I mean, in her last fight, um, she and Lumalukbumi went went back and forth with reversals and takedowns and 
and submission attempts and things like that. So at least you can create action. And when you create action, it actually affects both sides of this. So even though Brazil's you know inside the distance prop is not great, I think that if Gomes does try for takedowns and tries to do all kinds of stuff, at least it creates some activity. And activity does create some points. So I do think that this fight is actually not as bad as maybe people might think. So I think this one is 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 because of the pace that's possible. Um, I think that you could play both both sides of this. Now, on the other hand, you have Zell Huber Venata, and this one to me is 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 like is like a yawner. Okay, Venata is basically a striker. If anything, he's has some kind of weak takedowns. And Zell Huber, he came into the UFC with all this hype, and he fought a very very low volume fight against. Um, Trey Ogden and lost. Um, I, mean, I have to think that he's going to bring a little more heat here. Um, so I guess it's possible that this fight is better than I think it is. But I mean, unless Zell Huber really just turns up the heat, I think it's going to be kind of a boring fight. So I don't really think it's that big of a deal to target this. I definitely don't like the Venata side. If anything, the upside kind of comes with Zell Huber. Um, the, the idea being that his last fight you could just kind of throw out. Um, so if anything, I will take the Zell Huber side. I think Venata is just a very poor DraftKings play on a slate like this. I mean, you need to have like a lot of pace. Speaking of which, okay, uh, we'll talk about the next literally three fights. And all three of these fights are going to be really, really big um, with respect to DraftKings. And the first one is Jillian Robertson versus Pierre Rodriguez. So Robertson is about a minus 130 or minus 120. So she should be about, you know, 8,300 on DraftKings. I think that's what she is, like 8,200, 8K. But the style of this fight is very conducive to, to activity. You know, you have Pierre Rodriguez, who just had a bunch of takedowns in her last fight. And you have Jillian Robertson, who's, who's a pretty good wrestler, but is really just superstar submission artist. So this fight is going to have a lot of stuff going on. A lot of takedowns, a lot of reversals, a lot of sub attempts. And at this price tag, this is exactly the type of fight that you want to target on a slate like this on DraftKings. So I think both of these fighters are in play. I think that Robertson is going to end up being far more popular just because of the, you know, just, let's just say, of the industry buzz I'm hearing. I mean, you're hearing that 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 Robertson's moving down in weight and it's like that much of it's a, that big of a deal. And that she's really going to be able to dominate Rodriguez. Fact is, she's only minus one twenty. It's not like she's minus four hundred. So, I don't exactly believe that it's it's so easy. Um, but in a fight like this, with all this activity, I do think that both sides of this you really have to play. This Cummings fight we already talked about. I mean, it's just an atrocious. It's just an atrocious play. I mean, he's ninety six hundred, and he and he is a what was he plus three hundred inside the distance. It's a disaster. So I wouldn't play that, and I certainly wouldn't play at Herman. But the next two, you, Roy Val versus Nicolau. So first of all, as far as pricing goes, it's um, – where is this? This is a 9,700. 9, yeah, so Nicolau's 9,100, Roy Val's 7,100. So from an inside-the-distance prop perspective, you want Nicolau to have an inside-the-distance prop of about Pickham. And you don't have that. You have like plus 200, which by itself is not really good. As a matter of fact, it's really funny. You look at the inside the distance prop, though, for Roy Val, who's a two to one underdog. And he is pretty much the same inside the distance as Nikola because Roy Val is going to ensure that this is a very high paced fight. He goes for everything. He doesn't really defend himself. He goes for zillions of takedowns and zillions of, of submissions and just, just goes for it. And that is just something that is going to be conducive to a lot of points being scored. Who's it going to be scored for? I don't know. All right. Uh, well, I can tell you that probably 66% of the time it's going to be for Nikola. 33% of the time it's going to be for Roy Val. But the fact is, is that, I mean, in my opinion, whenever you have like one guy that's really, that, that wants to be patient, and another guy who wants to turn up the heat, it's kind of difficult for the guy to be patient to keep that fight slow, right? It doesn't mean they're going to win, but it means that they're just going to have to be able to deal with a higher-paced fight. And 
I think Nikola is going to be more than happy to to entertain this after a while. So I think that that somebody gets finished in this fight. I think somebody scores well in this fight, and I would play both sides of this. Um, next one, another one, TJ Brown versus Bill Algio. From the inside the distance perspective, it's not really strong. You have the favorite, Bill Algio, who is, well, his inside the distance prop is plus like 250 or 275, which isn't great. And his price is 8,800. So you want a better inside the distance prop. TJ Brown inside the distance is not great either. It's like plus, you know, 400. But the thing is, again, is that this fight is going to operate at a high pace. Billy Algio is going to bring a lot of volume. He's going to pressure. And TJ Brown, his win condition is takedowns and submissions. So th th there's, you know, there will be no kind of like striking a range, I think, in this fight. And I think they're both guys are going to bring this. And even though the inside the distance prop is not that great, I think the overall volume and stuff that could happen is has a lot of ceiling here. Like this is, I think this is a fight where the winner could score a decent amount in, in a decision even. So um, I, uh, I like this fight. I, I want to target this one. Garcia uh, Guido, we kind of talked about, I mean, Garcia is, is inside the distance prop. I mean, he's first of all, he's 9,500. I mean, like he's, he's got a, either take Guida down a zillion times and finish him in the second round or finish him in the first round. And we just don't really have those scenarios. I mean, Garcia inside the distance plus like 220. And, you know, the thing about Gar about Guida is, I mean, Guida puts, Guida puts a little bit of volume and, and wrestling himself in there. So I don't see a dominating Garcia performance on the ground to get that, you know, second round sub type thing going on. So I think at 9,500, I think that he's pretty, Kind of a poor play, if you want to know the truth. Um, as far as, as as Guida goes, I mean, if in fact he can get these takedowns, I, he's certainly live at, at 60, whatever. Well, look at it. He's only a, a you know, plus 210, plus 230 underdog. So at plus 230, I've seen those types of guys be 7,600 before, 7,400. And his pricing, as I kind of alluded to before, is very, very low. I mean, it's 6,700. So I think he's got some just overall win equity on this card. You, you know, who's kind of like that. What really just kind of glossed over was, was Gomes. You know, Gomes, she's only like a two to one underdog and she's 6,900. It's a pretty fair, you know, bit of win odds if you want to know the truth. Um, as a matter of fact, she's not even that. Gomes is minus, is plus 150. I mean, this is a, I mean, that's an incredible bit of line value on her. That's actually really amazing. I, I forgot, I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, and that's the, what, what happens with linear pricing. Um, so I think Guida is very similar to Gomes in that respect. And uh, I just don't really like the favorite there. I mean, you see where we're headed here with these, with these builds. And one of the reasons why I don't even know if I'm going to need Gomes is because you might be able to do this with just middlers, but we'll see. Because we did want, we did like um, Bolanos, for example. Okay, um, Gutierrez Pedro Munoz. We talked about that one a little bit already, but that's rates to be a big old yawner. I mean, Gutierrez is ninety four hundred. At that price, you need an inside the distance prop of maybe one minus one thirty or so, or takedowns. And, and Gutierrez is basically a leg kicker, you know, and, and not to mention that that Munoz is very similar. I mean, this fight could basically be leg kicking at range for 15 minutes. Um, and at 9,500, I mean, this is just a pass. It just is. Um, Munoz himself at plus 190, does he have line value? Um, where's Munoz? Hold on. Munoz at 90, at 6,800. Yeah, that's not bad. But I think compared to Guida and Gomes, I think Guida and Gomes have a little more you know, scoring upside because of their takedowns. But you could make the argument that Munoz has, has some line value there, but I just don't know how he's going to score. You know, if, if anything, he just kind of outkicks Gutierrez somehow and, 
make 70 in, in a in a decision. Um, but definitely, I think Gutierrez is an extremely poor play. Um, okay, next one, Bozer versus Kutalaba. So this one, you just kind of have to play. Um, let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. You have Bozer inside the distance is plus 200 um, or so, which for his price at what, um, 8K? Is that what he is? Really? Some of that, 8,200? Let's take a look. At 7,800, I mean, that's a very, very strong play. And Kudalaba? So Kudalaba, he has a complete style edge with respect to drafting scoring. Um, when it comes to the inside the distance prop, first of all, it's pretty strong in and of itself, like plus 130 or something like that. But not only that, he's got takedown upside. I mean, as a matter of fact, he, he should be going for these takedowns. So between... His inside the distance prop, which is basically stronger than all the ninety, the 9K guys and up, plus his takedown upside, I think it's hard to dispute that 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 Kudalaba is probably just straight on the numbers the best play on the slate, right? I mean, think about it. His inside the distance prop at plus one, whatever, plus 130, is better than everybody else on the slate except for for Bolanos. And that includes all these 9,400 guys. You add into that his takedowns. I mean, this is almost, almost a mathematical lock, um, a theoretical mathematical lock on drafts in the context of the slate. Now, again, that doesn't mean that ownership is not going to you know factor into this, but just as far as the best play, I mean, how how can you dispute that? Um, now, with that said, for those reasons, he's probably going to be really high owned, and Bozer does have a good inside the distance prop of of, uh, of his own. So, I think this fight you definitely have to target, and I almost get a hundred percent of honestly. Uh, Muraz Akhanov versus Dustin Jacoby. Uh, you have Jacoby who is eighty nine hundred. So again, you're going to want. Um, you're going to want a uh, um, an inside the distance prop of about, eh, I'd say, plus 120 at the least. He doesn't have any grappling upside, so let's take a look. Jacoby inside the distance is plus 200, so this is a disaster. It's just a disaster. It, it's going to be a striking-based fight. And not only that, but it might not even be that high volume. You know, Moraz Akhanov, I mean, he kind of just like hunts – um, I guess Jacoby could put a volume based decision on him, but uh, I think there are just guys cheaper that could put up just as good of a score, if not better. Baraza Kanoff is an interesting one, you know, he's a plus 150 underdog and he's getting some good kind of linear pricing line value. Um, at 7,300, I and mean, that's really not bad. Um, not to mention his inside the distance prop. We'll take a look. I mean, plus th 260. That's not bad. And he's got a couple of takedowns in his arsenal. That's not bad, bad either. So I actually like the underdog here, Murzakhanov, a little bit more than J Jacoby uh, from a DraftKings perspective. Um, and then these last two fights are very well, are similar with respect to the overall theme of the slate. Uh, let's take a look at this. Billy Quarantillo versus Edson Barboza. Uh, he's a minus one, whatever, 60-ish with the VIG. He's actually priced kind of high. Well, I shouldn't say high, but higher than some of these others. He's 8,700. Um, I guess that's that's reasonable in general, but but again, because of linear pricing, he could have been, could have they could have given him 8,500 and been without, well within their rights, but 8,700 is actually fine because, I mean, the key to this fight is the theme of, of pace and Billy Quarantillo brings pace literally every single fight. Um, doesn't really care too much about getting hit. Doesn't care too much about anything except continuing to push a pace. Um, he could get some takedowns. He could get some volume. And this is really good for DraftKings scoring. It's really good for his DraftKings scoring. And you know what else? It's so bad for Barbosa's DraftKings scoring either, because if Billy Quarantillo just comes on in, 
I mean, Edson Barboza, he's, you know, listen, he's on the downside of his career, but he can still get it. He still has incredible leg kicks and he still could get a KO here. So um, I think this fight's a pretty, pretty important one to, to target. I think Quarantillo is obviously the better play. I mean, he's the favorite. He's got the takedowns. He's got the pace. He's got the whatever. And and, and Barbosa is a little more knockout dependent here. Um, it's going to be hard for Barbosa to really get a decision, I think, just because of all the volume that, that, that Quarantillo is going to bring. Um, but I definitely think Barbosa is live. But Quarantillo is obviously going to be a really good play. He's going to be a really popular play. As a matter of fact, I mean, who is who – is, I have to think that between Quarantillo and who did I mention? Uh, Kudalaba, these have to be the two best plays. I mean, they have to be the two best, you know, uh, whatchamacallit, most popular plays. I mean, Quarantillo is not even his inside the distance problem, which is fine anyway. His inside the distance problem is about plus 170, but it's just all that volume, you know, plus the takedowns. I mean, this could really be a monster score um, in a win. So between Quarantillo and and uh, uh, Kudalaba, that's the I. This is really the way you would you should start your lineups. That would be my opinion. And then in the the main event, uh, Arnold Allen versus Max Holloway. This is you know five rounds of a of, of big volume, and, and, and that's a lot of fantasy. Points. I mean, I know the inside the distance props here are not great, but they're not great in any fight. And you have Max Holloway who just brings the heat and brings the volume every fight. And he's got five rounds to work with. Um, and Arnold Allen, I mean, he could probably get some takedowns if he wants to. Um, he can bring some heat as well. But uh, I actually, in this particular main event, I do prefer the favorite. Normally, the 9K guy in the main event, I really need a good excuse to play because, you know, he's going to be popular uh there's probably other guys on the slate that are other over 9k that i want to play but in this particular card i mean who do i really need to play over 9k i mean there's just bolanos and and Mik and nicolau i like the two of them but all those big 9k guys i don't need so i can go play max holloway with kind of impunity here um and arnold allen sure i mean at 7k things go his way he gets some takedowns in i'll put it another way in a win I mean, you're just going to want him because he's not, you're not going to be able to avoid the pace. And that's why I kind of talked about that with respect to the, um, what fight was I talking about? The, the Roy Val and Nicolau fight. I mean, you're not going to be able to avoid a high pace if, if one guy really wants to bring it. So there's going to be, you know, you know, decision, I don't know, 350, 300 significant strikes thrown or connected. How many are you going to get? You know what I mean? Arnold Allen, I mean, if, if he gets the win, it's going to be because he either got probably 175 significant strikes in or he got a finish or he got some takedowns. So he's going to obviously be a strong play. So that's the theme of this kind of card is, is, is don't worry about the high price guys. Look, they can obviously win. You know, they, they obviously have, you know, decent win odds. But their win odds are not that great. Their upside is very, very poor. And I would have no problem Xing those guys out. Um, that being, uh, again, uh, guys like Zach Cummings. Uh, what's his name? Um, Rafa Hoffa Garcia. Chris Gutierrez. Um, I, I already mentioned Zach Cummings. And there was another 9,400. I forgot. No, who was that? Cummings, Garcia, Gutierrez. Brazil has a small chance, but I don't know. The highest price guy that's really a lot of interest is 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 Bolanos, and then followed by Nicolau. Jacoby, I don't. I really don't even need this. But the, the key is is to avoid these kind of like low pace fights. You know. Um, that, that this Zell Huber Venata fight, I don't, I, I really don't need this. You know, the, the Pudalova Edwards fight, I don't need this. Even this Jacoby Murzakana fight, I mean, I probably don't need that either. I, I'd probably just have underdog or nothing there. Um, Gutierrez Munoz, definitely don't need that. Garcia Guida, again, I don't even know how much I needed that. What you do need is, is 
the Pierre Rodriguez, Julian Robertson fight. I think you need the Algio TJ Brown fight. I think you need definitely the, the Kudalaba Bozer fight. You need the Quarantillo fight. And you probably need the Allen fight. So, so, you know, it's it's a really good card to play 20 lineups. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I know exactly where I want to concentrate all my stuff. For 150s, um, I don't think it's the greatest 150 max, just because you know, I, I don't even know. You know what I mean? Like where my 150 lineups would go. You know what you could do? Like you take those five fights and then you basically round robin them and play every combination of those five fights and then just fill in with the rest. That's a really good, extremely risky way to play 150. Um, you're going to need like at least four of those fights to smash. And that's kind of hard to do. Um, but uh, that is definitely one option. So again, to reiterate the fights I'm, I'm talking about from the, from the top down. Holloway Allen, Quarantillo Barboza, Kudalaba Bozer, Algio Brown, Roy Val Nicolau, that's the other one too, and Rodri uh, Robertson, Pierre Rodriguez. And then live underdogs, uh, Gomes, very good. Um, Gomes, look at this, look at this money line. Each time I look at this. So there's Gomes, there is uh, some degree Guida, to some degree uh which McCall what was his name? Uh, Munoz. Barboza is obviously somewhat live. I think Morris Akanoff is somewhat live. Um, and then as far as like high price favorites to kind of filter in, it would really just be maybe some Brazil, but mostly just the uh, the Belongs. And uh, that will do it. We're going to uh, come back tomorrow with the betting breakdown, which is uh, definitely a lot of fun. And until then, uh, good luck, everybody.